Connecting your HMI or SCADA to an RTU via DMP3. This demonstration will give you a brief overview of the DMP protocol and its application within the top server. The DMP3 protocol, first developed by GE Harris in 1993, was a comprehensive effort to achieve open, standards-based interoperability between master stations and substation computers for the electric utility industry. It is based on the work of the IEC Tech Committee 57 that also resulted in the IEC 6875 protocol. GE Harris later turned over ownership and responsibility for further development and evolution to the DMP3 users group. DMP has become widely used in industries such as water wastewater, transportation, and oil and gas. These industries can have geographically dispersed field RTUs over paid transmission media such as cellular radio, so keeping costs down on these networks is critical. DMP is a very efficient protocol in bandwidth usage, which is why it has found a home in these industries. There are many aspects of DMP that make it unique from other protocols. DMP in nature is a synchronous protocol. It uses both unsolicited messages and report by exception communications to increase efficiency and bandwidth utilization. When used properly, DMP decouples the scan rates between the client server and the master slave, meaning there is no relation between your client items that are configured and what gets scanned by the driver. That being said, DNP also supports a demand pulling option to allow it to operate like most other drivers. As I mentioned, DNP is a synchronous protocol, requiring an acknowledgement, timeout, or confirmed failure for the current command before the next one in queue is transmitted. The driver will often queue multiple commands within a typical DNP timeout period. The DNP stack must dispose of these commands in the order received. Outstanding commands for still responsive slave devices can be blocked until the command queue empties, which in practice means that requesting too much data too fast can be painful. This being said, due to the report by exception and unsolicited messaging features, it is very efficient in bandwidth usage, which is important with wireless or cellular communications. To reap the benefits of the DMP protocol, avoid demand polling and use reasonable integrity and event poll intervals given your transmission method and amount of data needed. DNP decouples the scan rates in proper usage. In most drivers, the topic or group scan rate in the HMI or client drives the device polling rate. The client will send a request for data at a given update interval and this is passed through the driver layer, causing a scan of the devices at the same rate. With proper DMP usage, the scan rate between the client and server and DMP master and slave are completely independent. The client sends a data update request at one interval, causing the client to pull the driver data buffer at this rate. During this time, the driver is performing integrity and event pulls at the rate specified in the driver, updating the buffer at these rates. There are four types of DNP communications. An integrity poll requests all data from the slave regardless of data changes and what the client is asking for. This is usually done at startup and then is performed very infrequently after startup. Event polls request all data changes since the last event or integrity poll, regardless of what the client is polling. If the slave is configured to send timestamps, the timestamps for these events will come from the device. Unsolicited messages are sent by the slave on an event or data change if it is configured to do so, without a pull request from the master. The timing and deadband for these messages are handled by the slave. Please note the importance of firewall settings. If you are using unsolicited messages and your firewall does not have the proper exceptions, your unsolicited packets will be rejected. Demand polling allows the driver to work in a traditional master-slave polling method. This will retrieve data for points defined for demand polling, whether the data has changed or not. Be aware that this removes the efficiency of the DMP protocol and is not recommended unless necessary. There are a few standard use cases that we encounter regularly. First, you can connect your HMI or SCADA causing the DMP stack to initialize the session. Then, during initialization, an integrity poll is performed. After the integrity poll, we only listen for unsolicited messages, never performing an event poll. More commonly, we see the event poll and unsolicited messaging mixed. After the initial integrity poll, you will perform event polls at regular intervals, perform integrity polls at infrequent intervals, and listen for unsolicited messages if the slave is configured for such. Sometimes devices have some data points that can only be read explicitly from the device. This is the demand polling option. The only other use case we have encountered for demand polling is regulatory reporting requirements that require a point or points to be reported at specific intervals regardless of value change. 
So what happens when communications fail between the master and slave? Most of the time you would lose that data. However, DNP slaves can store event data for each point and then send the data when communications are re-established. Your slave determines if it can buffer, how much data it can buffer, and all other buffering settings. Configuration of these slave hardware settings is outside the scope of our support. Once we have good communications, what happens? A properly configured DMP slave that fully supports the DMP protocol specification will send the events with timestamps to the master in the sequence with oldest timestamps sent first. The top server can then buffer these events up to its configurable maximum per tag and play these out to the client application at a user configurable playback rate. Please do note that we replay these events in the order we receive them from the slave. So if the slave provides the events in the correct first in, first out timestamp order, the events will be sent to the client in the same order. Using event buffering does come at some opportunity cost. When enabled, it will introduce latency into the tags of the affected objects. After the initial group of events are sent, new updates from the slave will only be released to the client at the playback rate. Therefore, it is wise to use this feature only when capturing all events is more important than fast delivery of the events to the client. DNP items are addressed with a four-part address object.variation.index.subtype or subattribute. The object is the data object group to which the item belongs. Variation defines the default data type for the item. Index is the data object within the group. For example, the fifth point in the group would have an index of 4 because indexing as well as variations start at 0. The subattribute or subtype is the attribute you wish to read for the specific index or point. Most often, you will use dot value to read the index value, but depending on the object and variation, there are a number of attributes available such as dot timestamp, dot explicit, and dot restart. Alternative to dot value, you would use the dot explicit subattribute to cause the tag to become demand polled, which as we discussed earlier will cause the tag to work like tags in traditional polling PLC drivers. When setting up DMP tags, it is essential to have the DMP slave profile document for your device. This will let you know what the DMP addresses are used for, what event class they belong to, and how to access them. Here is an example of a slave profile from a multi multi multi-smart pump controller. Chapter 3 lists the object numbers, the various available variations, and their descriptions. Chapter 4 gives you the index, though they call it the DMP ID, conditions when set and clear, and the event class for the point. In a proper DMP implementation, your number of tags in the client or server will have no effect on what points are scanned or updated from the DMP slave. The driver abstracts a lot of the DMP protocol and slave profile details, so you don't have to get caught up in those. The important part is to focus on finding the addressing list in your slave profile. This process could take some time. If you understand DMP addressing and your DMP slave device vendor has provided a clear and concise document, this process will not be too difficult. If you don't see an object number from your slave profile list in the addresses supported by the server, this does not mean it isn't supported. Some objects are reflected or addressed under the hood using a base object. There is great detail in the help file about these objects. For example, if you wish to read from object 32, you would address that by using the correct variation for object 30 to cause object 32 to be used. Now that we've been through an overview of how the protocol works, let's take a look at its application within the top server. The next video will go through a demonstration of the top server configuration to a DMP3 device.